Well, again, we do invite you that if you came prepared um, to give an offering today as an act of worship, uh, we have baskets that are set up, or you can also give online if that is the way that you choose. Well, it is good to gather here together today. As was mentioned, next Sunday is a little iffy about the weather, but today is a beautiful day um, to gather around as a body of Christ, to enjoy God's creation, and to sing his praises today. So thank you um, to everyone who makes this time of worship happen. Um, it is such a gift with all that is going on in the world that we still get to come and, and be together, be the body of Christ together. So I thank you for coming. I thank you for participating and, uh, and being part of our church family here. Well, we are continuing on in the book of Mark. Um, today, as we are looking at the life of Jesus, we are listening in to some of the critical moments to his life. These moments, um, as people struggle to comprehend who Jesus is, who he says he is, who he reveals himself to be. Throughout Mark, um, Jesus is revealing the truth in bits and pieces of, of who he is. He is showing that he is the king of the Jews, but so much more than people expected. He is showing that he is the Messiah, but then so much more, so much more depth, so much more meaning than people could ever have imagined or hoped. And for those who are paying attention, for those who are listening to what Jesus says, the truth comes bursting forth that Jesus is Emmanuel, that Jesus is God with us. Well, the first chapter of Mark, which we covered over the last couple of weeks, uh, we found Jesus baptized in the desert and sent out to go and do the ministry, to go out and do the mission of God. He also called disciples by name. He invited them to come and to turn and to follow him. His popularity grew exponentially with crowds flocking to him to hear his teaching and to see him and to experience the miracles that he is performing. Well, with this explosive growth came a number of voices that started chiming in. People who thought they understood who Jesus was and what he was supposed to be doing, and sometimes even trying to direct him as to where he should go. Now, Jesus knew the mission that he had. He knew that his task was more than just performing miracles, was more than just drawing a crowd, but he knew that he had a message to proclaim, that he had come to proclaim the kingdom of God. And he also knew that in three years he would suffer and he would die. So to keep the mission on the right track, there were times when Jesus had to correct and redirect people. There were times when Jesus had to silence people who wanted to take him off course. Now one of the voices that he attempted to silence was that of the leper, which we talked about last week. But this grateful leper, even after Jesus told him to be quiet and not to tell anybody about this, still went and he spread the word far and wide, and soon Jesus' popularity and the crowds grew and grew, and he ended up leaving town, had to go outside town in order to, to get away from some of the crowds. Well, today we pick up with Jesus as he heads back home to the city of Capernaum. Now, when you meet someone new, one of the first questions you ask is, well, hey, where are you from? Now, sometimes that answer is simple. Oh, I'm from San Diego. Well, I'm from the Central Valley. Maybe you're from Iowa. Maybe you're from Seattle. Maybe as far away as the Netherlands or the Philippines. But for many of us, the answer is a bit more complicated than that. Maybe you were born in one place. Maybe you grew up in another place. And then maybe a third place is a place that you consider home. Well, to Jesus, the question of where do you come from is complicated as well. His true home, as we know, is with the Father. You know, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, who's Jesus, and the word was with God and the word was God. As for his earthly home, he was born in the town of Bethlehem outside of Jerusalem in southern Israel. He grew up in Nazareth in the region of Galilee, southwest of the Sea of Galilee. Well, when he began his ministry, Matthew 4 tells us that Jesus moved to Capernaum along the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And it was his home base as he traveled, as he taught, as he went around teaching people, as he went and healing people and performing miracles and calling people. Well, in Mark 2, 1, the people of Capernaum are excited because they heard that Jesus is coming back to town. He's coming back home. They don't just have to hear about what he's been teaching. They don't just have to hear about the miracles that he is performing. They are going to get to see it firsthand. But alongside these excited crowds 
we start to learn that there is an opposition growing. There's a group of people, a group of leaders who have heard what is happening. And they're not ready to accept what Jesus is saying and what Jesus is doing. So I invite you to hear now the word of the Lord as Jesus comes face to face with the Pharisees and other critics in Mark chapter 2 all the way through Mark chapter 3 verse 6. So if you do have your Bible, I invite you to have it, uh, to open it up. I'm going to be reading from the NIV today, um, but whatever translation you choose, I um, invite you to have your Bible open during this time if you have one with you. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. So the man got up, he took his mat, and he walked out in full view of all of them. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth in an old garment. Otherwise the new piece will pull away from the old, making the, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. And as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to them, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered, Well, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. He also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger. In deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. 
Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ. We thank you for sending your son to show us the way, to teach us your word, to help us to follow you, Lord, to correct us, to save us, to be our God, to be our Savior. Lord, as we open your word today, as we study your word, what you have to say, Lord, open our hearts that we might hear. Open our minds that we might be changed. Help us to trust you. Help us to follow you. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for being the great king. Lord, today as we study, may the words in my mouth and the meditations of all of our heart be pleasing and honoring and glorifying to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So in Mark 2, what we just read, we came across some pretty inspiring moments from the life of Jesus as he heals this paralyzed man, this, this wonderful, rich story of the, the man whose friends ripped a hole in the roof and lowered him down so he could be brought before Jesus. Read about Jesus sharing a meal with tax collectors and sinners, reaching out to those that everyone else rejected and hated. We also hear some of Jesus' most powerful teaching as he corrects some of these common misunderstandings and misuses of the Sabbath, reminding us that, that, that the Sabbath is a gift from God. It's meant to bless us. It's not a prison meant to confine us or wear us down. It's not a source of self-righteous judgment so that we can condemn others. What's shocking to me about this passage is how quickly things escalated with the Pharisees. See, I remember that, that it was early on that they opposed Jesus, and I remember that it was fairly early on that they even started plotting how to get rid of him. But I had forgotten that it was just early in that third chapter, in Mark 3, 6, that the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. So that means in 34 verses, the Pharisees and these others have gone on quite a journey. They've gone from being a non-factor, not even mentioned in the story, to the sworn enemies of Jesus, who even go so far as to plot his murder, and not just with anyone, with the Herodians, with these traitors, with these people who were working with Herod and with the Romans. Now, whether you grew up in the church or not, whether you're super familiar with the Bible or not, you probably know that if someone calls you a Pharisee, it's not a compliment. I remember several years ago hearing that song, you know, I don't want to be a Pharisee. You know that song? Am I the only one? There you go. Because a Pharisee is not fair, you see. I just want to be a sheep. Nobody wants to be a Pharisee. They're judgmental. They're nasty. They're mean. They were awful to Jesus. They had this terrible reputation. But not necessarily always. See, today the Pharisee is seen as your typical villain. They hated Jesus. They were sneaky they tried to trap him. They even conspired to murder him. But it's important for us to understand a bit of the history of the Pharisees and to say, okay, let's at least give them a fair representation of who they were and what history and what scripture even has to say about them. See, first of all, not all of the Pharisees actually rejected Jesus. We look and we say, wow, those Pharisees were awful and they all hated Jesus. They all rejected him. But that was not the case that all of them did so. Some were on this genuine search to figure out, is, is Jesus legit? Is what he's saying accurate? And some people even looked at, at the evidence and said, yeah, I think this is the guy. I think of somebody like Nicodemus who came to Jesus. Now he came in secret because he was afraid of some of the others, but he came to Jesus. And then you look at Joseph of Arimathea, and there's some question as to whether he was a Pharisee, but he was a, a member of the, of the council. So another one who came and believed in Jesus and followed him. Well, the second thing to keep in mind is not only were some of them actually faithful people who, who believed Jesus, but they were not actually infamous in their day. In the first century Israel, the Pharisees, for the large part, were well respected. Many of them were seen as, I don't know if I would use the word theologian, but something like that, interpreters of the law. They helped the common people to understand, to say, okay, we're supposed to follow the law, but what are the intricacies of that? What does that look like in my, in my daily life? 
You know, for example, okay, the third commandment, that you are to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Well, what does it mean to work? What does it mean to keep it holy? What are we called not to do? Well, the problem is that many of the Pharisees had become legalistic in their interpretation of the law. One of the problems with legalism is not only are they proficient at condemning others for their, own, for their sin, but they have become quite adept at finding loopholes for their own. Now, one other role that the Pharisees would play is that of a gatekeeper, it would seem in this instance when they're dealing with Jesus. They heard about this Nazarene who was living in Capernaum. He has this huge following. He's been doing these miracles. He has these new teachings. And there are even rumors that he may be the Messiah. So they go on their way and they go to check him out and see if what people are saying is true and accurate. And I think there's, again, I don't think the, that the Pharisees are completely off base with that. I mean, I gotta say, if, if I had, you know, if we heard rumors about some new teacher that was out there and with, you know, the internet and with the ability for people to, to publish things and, and share things. If I heard about a pastor who was out there, they had this new mega church and they had grown huge. And then a number of people at the church here were saying, you know, this guy's really interesting. And you start sharing things and I go, let me look into that. He's making some claims that are kind of interesting. I better, I better check that out. So the Pharisees and the other leaders, they start showing up. They start listening to what Jesus has to say and their ears start to perk up at some of the things that Jesus is saying. What they view as questionable theology, questionable teaching, questionable interpretation of God's word. Well, very quickly they go from questioning to accusation and contempt. They start following him around, trying to trip him up, trying to track him, trying to trap him in his words. And when they've had enough, they decide that he has to go. And they start plotting his murder. Well, as the Pharisees are engaging in this shocking display, fed by fear and conspiracy, Jesus is also busy. And he's doing really the last thing that I would expect him to do, or at least the last thing that I would do if I was in his case. He picks a fight. He actually goes after them and says, okay, let's deal with this now. Let's go head on. But this is not Jesus as an angry bull in a china shop. This is a very strategic thing that Jesus does. Let's think through some of those instances that we just read about in Mark chapter 2. In the first incident, uh, there's this huge crowd that has gathered. And these friends, you know, they, they, they take this man up on the roof. They, he is... He is paralyzed and they've decided they're going to bring him before Jesus, which is a whole wonderful thing that I would love to spend time on, but we just don't have time for it today, is the, the, the faith of these friends and the faithfulness of these friends and their desire to bring this man before Jesus, knowing that if I bring him to Jesus, he will be healed. So there they are up on the roof. They rip this hole in the roof. They lower the man down. Huge crowd. Everybody's watching. Everybody's paying attention. And this was a, I mean, I wouldn't say that it was common for somebody to rip a hole in the roof, but it was fairly common for the crowds to bring somebody in and say, will you heal my friend? Will you heal my loved one? So what Jesus could have done was just said, you're healed, and then continue on with his teaching. But he doesn't. As everyone's watching, as all this is happening, he says to the man, son, your sins are forgiven. Well, the Pharisees are scandalized. And rightfully so. They say only God can forgive sins. And they're right. Anyone else who claims to forgive sins is a blasphemer, is lying, is taking the role, the position of God. Well, then Jesus drives it home. He doesn't just leave it there. He doesn't explain it away. He says, to show you that I do have authority to forgive sins, he turns and says to the man, be healed right now in front of all these people, stand up and walk out. So Jesus deals with the issue head on. He picks a fight. Well, later Jesus is walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee and he finds not just anyone, he comes across Levi, the tax collector at the booth there. The one who everyone knows, infamous, traitor, the worst sinner that you can find. And Jesus invites him to follow and to be a disciple. 
But it doesn't just stop there. It doesn't just stop with, I'm going to go and invite this guy as everybody's watching. He then goes into Levi's home and he eats a meal with him and he's surrounded by the other tax collectors and by the worst all of all kinds of sinners for everyone to see, for the Pharisees to see what he is doing. Well, later on, it's the Sabbath. And we have a couple incidences where Jesus is doing some things on the Sabbath. The first is that Jesus and the disciples are traveling. So as they're walking through this grain field, where they're moving along, he's kind of this itinerant preacher who's traveling around. But you don't travel on the Sabbath. Sure, you have this little bit of distance that you can go to, but that's, that's about it. This is unacceptable. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, as Jesus and his disciples are traveling, some of them are seen as they're walking through this grain field and they're, and they're pulling off these grains and they start to eat them. They're harvesting. And harvesting is pretty specific. In the Talmud, it has this definition. Okay, what are the definitions of work? Because the people need to figure out what can we do and what can we not do? Well, number three is harvesting or reaping. And that's exactly what these guys are seen doing. So here we have Jesus. Not only is he a teacher, Jesus is a rabbi, right? And the rabbi is leading these people along. He has these people quite literally walking in his footsteps, learning from him, following him, learning how to be one of his people. He's leading them into sin in their mind. And then as they are sinning further, as they are working on the Sabbath, Jesus condones their behavior. Now, I don't think that what Jesus did and what the disciples did was actually breaking the Sabbath law. There's some debate about that as to whether they were directly breaking the biblical law. But what he does have them do is they break at least a common understanding of the Sabbath law. But either way, it's really interesting to know whether he is directly breaking the Sabbath law or whether he is just bending it a little bit is that it wasn't just any law that Jesus broke. It wasn't just any law that Jesus challenged. It was the Sabbath law. Now the Sabbath is one of the big ones, right? It's in the Ten Commandments. Right after you have no other gods before me and no graven images. And the Sabbath, this is not just a one-time thing either. It wasn't just mentioned in the Ten Commandments and that's it. Over and over again, God tells his people, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. Do not work. Do not do these things. Don't let other people work. There's even strong consequences for those who fail to keep it. Death. Well, keeping the Sabbath is still one of those kind of defining characteristics of what does it mean to be Jewish? What does it mean to be the people of Israel? It's an essential part. It was, it's an essential part today and it was a very essential part in the first century. Jesus doesn't break rules by accident. It wasn't just an oversight. It's not just that he didn't notice. Jesus was challenging the people. Jesus was directly confronting the Pharisees and their interpretation and application really of the entire law. Well, at the end of the conversation, Mark 2, 27 through 28, he says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now, Jesus isn't saying that the Sabbath doesn't matter. Jesus isn't rejecting the Sabbath. Remember that that the Son of Man didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He's saying you've been doing it wrong. The Sabbath, like all of God's commands, is a gift meant to bless and to direct God's people. But you guys blew it. You totally missed the point. You've made it into a burden. And he says, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again, Jesus is revealing so much about himself if if people are actually paying attention. Saying if anyone has the right to kind of redefine what the Sabbath is supposed to be about, to clarify what the Sabbath is supposed to be about, it's me. I am Lord even of the Sabbath. We'll mix into the middle of the conversation. Jesus mentions David. And it describes a time when David, um, before he was the king of Israel, he was fleeing from the corrupt, anointed king Saul. Saul wanted to kill David. Well, David, out of necessity, goes into 
the temple, he asked the whole, the, for the holy bread from the priest so he and his men can eat. Now, on one level, Jesus has given an example, saying, you know, there's times when the needs of people and when the mission of God, because he was, you know, Jesus was out doing the mission of God and David was out doing the mission of God, where there's times when that is more important than a strict application of the law. But there's more happening here than just that. Because the person who he talks about is David. So he's saying... He's connecting himself, again, to King David. And again, for those who are paying attention, I am the Messiah, I am the King, I am the promised one of God. Now it's also interesting that not only is he pointing forward to himself when he's talking about David and helping people to recognize who he is, he's comparing himself to David in another way, I think. David was the anointed one of God. And David was the one, because Saul had become corrupt. Saul was the one who originally was anointed, who was supposed to be the one who was guiding God's people, but he had become corrupt. David was chosen to replace him. And Saul was trying to kill him. Does this sound familiar at all? Jesus is the anointed one. The people, the, the leaders of Israel were supposed to be leading the people, but were not doing it faithfully and they're about to be replaced. As Jesus is revealing the truth about himself as the Holy One of God, he is also not so subtly revealing the difficult truth of what the Pharisees had become. Well, the final incident comes in Mark 3, 1 through 6. Jesus is not done ruffling feathers. He heals the man with a paralyzed hand. Now again, this was a fairly common incident for Jesus to heal someone. But this time it's different because it happens on the Sabbath and it happens in the synagogue. Now there's a pretty good chance that this was actually kind of a setup by the Pharisees and by the others. They're waiting to catch Jesus doing something wrong. So they know that it's a Sabbath, they know that it's in the synagogue, they know where Jesus is, so they send this man in. And the way I see it is a little bit like entrapment. You know, they see Jesus like, okay, Jesus is not going to be able to help himself with this. It's kind of like sending a, you know, a undercover, like on TV, you know, they send in like a, an undercover cop as a, as a drug dealer and you go like to a, a crack house and you go, hey, shocker, people there were, were tempted to use drugs. They know the compassion of Jesus. They know that he, in their minds, can't help himself from having mercy, having compassion on this man. So they send him in to tempt Jesus to heal. Here's Jesus with this huge crowd waiting for him to mess up. And he knows exactly what they're doing. So he asks them, he says, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? Silence. He looks around at them angry, but he also looks around at them with sadness, with pity for their hard and stubborn hearts. Okay, this is what you want to see. You want to see me heal him? Friends, stretch out your hand and be healed. What we see in each interaction, in each section of this story that we read, is a group of people being given an image, a snapshot of who Jesus is. They're given an opportunity to experience the kingdom of God. And they're invited to respond, to receive him, to follow him or to reject him. And in each moment, we have this contrast, right? We have these very intelligent, very holy people who are incapable of seeing the truth. But then we have these sinners, we have these broken people, we have the sick, we have the outcasts, we have the rejects. But they see and believe and they step out boldly in faith. The man on the mat, lying there on the ground, surrounded by a huge crowd, thinking these Pharisees are about to lose it. They think he's a liar. And now he's telling me to stand up. What do I do? Well, he stood up. And because he accepted Jesus' offer, he was healed. And the people in that place saw the hand of God. And they praised him. Think about Levi. Levi had to take a big step as well. 
sitting at the tax booth. Everyone knows who I am. Jesus is coming over to me. Everyone knows what kind of person I am. They all hate me. Jesus knows who I am. Is this for real? He's telling me to follow him, but is this just a setup? Is he going to use me as an example of what a sinner is, of what a terrible person I am? But because Levi accepted Jesus' offer and followed him, not only did he get to experience the grace of Jesus Christ, but when he invited his friends over, he invited all these sinners, all these messed up people, you had more people who were given a chance to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. He invited his friends to the table. They heard the good news. They experienced the grace of God. Well, then the man in the synagogue, standing there in front of Jesus and the Pharisees, it's the Sabbath. These experts clearly know that it's wrong for Jesus to heal me today. So what do I do? Jesus is saying to put my hand and and to stretch it out. What do I do? Well, because he accepted Jesus' offer, because he stretched out his hand, because he believed Jesus, he was healed. And he experienced the grace of God. Every day, Jesus seeks us out, seeks each one of us out. He invites us to respond to him, to worship him, to trust him, and to follow him. And he calls us to invite others to the table as well. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for reaching out to sinners, to broken people like me. Lord, for some of us, our sin is obvious. For some of us, our sin is hidden. Sometimes it seems huge. Sometimes it seems small. But Lord, I have no right to follow you. I have no right to be invited to follow you. But still, you choose me. Lord, help me to hear your call and to follow you, to trust you, even when it's difficult. Jesus, thank you for calling sinners. Thank you for loving us, for calling us your own. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we get to celebrate communion together. Today we get invited just like the tax collectors and and other folks were invited